Welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Emma Brush, Managing Editor of the Breakthrough Journal. And I'm Alex Trembath, Communications Director at Breakthrough. Breakthrough Dialogues invites leading thinkers to talk technological and modern solutions to environmental problems. It's part of our effort to move beyond the tribalism and polarization that too often characterizes environmental thought and politics today. This week, we sat down with Jen Bernstein, a geographer at the University of Southern California and the author of a recent, and we think paradigm-shifting, essay on feminism and environmentalism. Historically, environmentalism has not navigated gender all too well, and today, its embrace of time and labor-intensive practices at home and on the farm affect women disproportionately. What we need instead, Jen says, is an environmentalism that takes both modernity and the vast benefits it's brought women around the world seriously. Jen, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So last year, you published an essay in the Breakthrough Journal that resonated with a wide variety of readers in which you called for an environmentalism that takes both modernization and its broadly beneficial impact on women's lives seriously. So can you tell us a bit about what this kind of environmentalism would look like? Well, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emma. Um, it was a it was a fun piece to write. And I've, I've, I've mentioned a few times since that you never really know what you write, um, what what things you write will resonate with people. And so it's been really nice to see that the sort of intersection of my own sort of personal observations with my academic and professional life um, ended up being something that that a lot of women and, and men ended up connecting with. Um, so in general, I was actually hit with the realization for this piece as it, you know, as it would be fitting at the Breakthrough Dialogue 2016, when I was listening to, uh, Lee Phillips, uh, who's a, who's a great speaker on, on, um, uh, modernization and environmentalism. And, uh, I, I sort of had this, one of those lightning bolts <laughs> where I, where I realized that the only type of feminism, um, that could really make sense was one that embraced these ideas of, of modernity. Um, and that sort of led me to get into this, to this research that looked at, you know, ecofeminism, which, which has been an area of research uh, in its own right for a very long time, but sort of helped me look at it in a different way and connect it with a lot of other sort of fields of, of study, along with sort of many of the contemporary demands uh, of contemporary environmentalism. Yeah, so I'll cut in right there. I mean, can you tell us a bit about what ecofeminism is, what it was when it first emerged, um, what it was responding to within environmental discourse that, of course, has its own long um, gendered history? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, like you alluded to, there's been a longstanding connection between uh, the relationship between women and men and the environment and the different ways in which men and women sort of experience um, environmental problems and the different ways in which they respond to them. And uh, sort of in the 60s, 1970s, you know, theorists like Carolyn Merchant at UC Berkeley and Karen Warren um, basically sort of suggested that women, because they tend to be more likely to have been subject to various forms of oppression, are sort of more aware of uh, environmental injustices. Um, also, from a global perspective, uh, women are more likely to be poor and disenfranchised, and thus are sort of more likely to be on the receiving end of environmental impacts. Um, even further, uh, they're more likely to be caretakers uh, and thus are sort of more sensitized to the environmental health concerns uh, for both themselves and their families. So this is sort of the most mainstream approach to ecofeminism. And the great thing about this field of study is that it doesn't say that there is anything about gender in particular that makes women have a particular response to environmental problems but rather the way in which gender is socially constructed has, has led to a world in which because of the social roles that women tend to play, whether we like it or not, they tend to experience the environment in a different way. 
Um, however, there's also a, a, another vein, and I will say that this is kind of the minority, but it is what I was really responding to in, in the paper that I wrote for the journal, and it was what led to the title of you know Mother Earth and Mer- Earth Mothers, because this idea of Mother Earth to me seemed like you know, such an obvious conflation between women and, and the earth. Um, and in that conflation um, is this sense of biological determinism. Um, and again, this is the minority, but this is this idea that, you know, women are sort of more connected to nature, uh, that they can speak on behalf of nature as an account, you know, on the account of their sort of biological systems, right? So menstruation, reproductive capacity, there's sort of this mystical connectedness that women have with the earth um, and, and, and therefore they are sort of enabled to speak on its behalf. Um, and this is, it's sort of ironic because this whole myth of mother earth was actually rooted in native American tradition, specifically with the words of a tribal elder, uh, from the Navajo tribe. But then I went way down the rabbit hole and found out that this legend, there's no actual, you know, veracity <laughs> that it actually existed. Um, you know, but, but, you know, the way in which, uh, native American tribes, have been conflated with nature is really similar um, rhetorically to the way that women have been conflated. And, and the problem with both of these is that, you know, when women are seen as doing something outside of what sort of uh, uh, mainstream environmentalism sees to be as the proper way of relating to nature, they're seen as violating their own nature, right? Because when you conflate sort of women you know, with the biophysical environment, they sort of lack agency over their bodies. They're at the mercy of these biological systems. And they're really sort of seen as, as lacking an agency over, over the way in which they respond to, to environmental issues. Um, so this is not, like I say, this is not the mainstream, you know, but the degree to which this idea of Mother Earth has predominated um, within our discourse, I think really does sort of show the way in which, you know, women are sort of given this um, authority over speaking for nature, but at the same time, the consequences of that, I I think, have really um, large ramifications that are also unequal uh, according to, um, uh, you know, wealth and ethnicity and and, and gender. Um, So I would say that sort of that sort of environmental um, or sort of ecofeminism um, um, in a nutshell, and and like I say, it's a it's a really great field of study. Um, I respect a lot of the the women in it, um, but the way in which it's sort of been appropriated in in maybe sort of a, a, a mainstream discourse, I, I think has a lot of problems. An- another element of this that a lot of people have observed, Jen, is environmentalism's white guy problem, the, the, the observation that many of the, the sort of scions, the main writers, the, the, the influencers, the leaders of the environmental movement in the past half century or so have, have been white guys. Um, and, and ecofeminism arose partly as well in, in response to that. And I should note that, that Breakthrough is not remotely immune to, to this problem. If, if you look at our, at our events, um, if, you, if you look at our staff, particularly several years ago, um, it, it suffered from, from this, same, uh, this same narrowness and the same blindness, blindness of perspective. And I, I think that what got us into more interesting conversations that, that really affected our work has been an, an effort here to try and uh, to both increase the the number of, of women um, and in our in our events and in our journal, but also to internationalize our network to increase the the the, um, the cultural diversity um, and the and the ideological diversity, and and that ha- has really changed the, the way that that we think about things. So I, I wonder if you see progress from. The, the eco-feminist critique of environmentalism, of the white guy problem, or of of the very gendered way of thinking about women in these discourses, how how do you think environmentalism has reacted to this eco-feminist response? Um, yeah, Alex, I really appreciate that. Um, both you know, both the sentiment and the willingness of of breakthrough to sort of you know really broaden the range of voices contributing to the dialogue and the journal and and the conversations that you guys facilitate. I've, you know, I've, I've watched breakthrough grow from the beginning and I've, I've seen, um, I've seen a real willingness to um, entertain, 
you know, views that are, you know, far outside of, of the eco-modernist perspective. And, and it was, you know, really exciting to write this piece um, and to have your team be so receptive to it because, you know, beforehand I, I did feel myself sort of split between my identity as an environmentalist and my identity as a feminist and, and trying to reconcile the two um, was something I'd never really figured out before. Um, so, you know, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, another thing I, I, I wrote about in the article, you know, was the way in which, um, you know, and, and again, as like a lifelong environmentalist, I, I know that a lot of the, the hand wringing in these groups, um, has to do with, you know, how do we make people care more? And of course, you know, people is a loaded term, right? Who are we talking about here and where are they? And how do we make them care more about nature as if this sort of affective, um, relationship was really the one dictating our behaviors. Um, and, and I think that does, you know, in some ways come from kind of the white guy problem, right? You know, it's just, we just need to care more and then we'll act in a certain way without seeing these very real barriers towards being able to engage with the world in the way that, you know, we want to. And that's part of, you know, being a member of, of, of various groups that maybe don't have the type of agency that, other groups have that are so used to having um, that they can't even imagine sort of not having it. (laughs) Um, uh, So uh, another thing I think about, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a geographer and, you know, I also think about sort of the role of place, you know, how do the places that we live and the places that we go to affect the way in which we engage with the world. And, you know, part of, I think, you know, environmentalism's, you know, white guy thing really is rooted in, you know, Lewis and Clark and, you know, Daniel Boone back in the day. Um, We've got Thoreau, we've got, you know, good old Ed Abbey, you know, and Yvonne Chouinard and Dave Foreman. And these are all folks who, you know, growing up as an environmentalist in the late 90s, you know, these were my heroes and they still are. Um, But at the same time, when you think of it from the perspective of a geographer, you know, these are folks who would go out into the wilderness uh, and then come back. They would go out and they would camp and they would defend and they would, uh, you know, uh, live in a tree and, and, and granted, you know, lots of women, Julia Butterfly uh, Hill up in Northern California in the mid 2000s did that to great to great fanfare. But, um, uh, you know, and then they would come back to sort of home and the domestic world. Whereas when you look at women who are prominent in the environmental movement, and again, there have been many, many, many of them, and they've they've historically been discounted, you know, by experts. Uh, You know, if you look at Love Canal in New York, um, you know, their concerns were trivialized because, you know, these were hysterical housewives just being crazy. So this is not to say the concerns were unfounded, you know, but 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 women sort of within the environmental movement have tend to play the role of being at home and having the environmental problems come to them. Um, so the, the whole idea of, you know, the environment and, and how one relates to it has a lot to do with where one is and where one goes. Um, and also the role of, of unpaid labor, which, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get to talk about a, a little bit. Um, and, and I really do believe that whoever is responsible for the bulk of unpaid labor um, really has a very different relationship to how they can engage um, on a lifestyle basis with with environmental problem solving, um, be it male or female. Um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a female thing, although, you know, globally women women do tend to do the vast majority of, of unpaid labor. Yeah, Jen, I'd love to dig into that second point because um, the, you kind of, you draw out maybe two strains of contemporary environmentalism um, with regard to unpaid labor that I think are really will be really interesting for our listeners to um, dig into a little bit. So on the one hand, you have the rich world, um, what you call lifestyle environmentalism, um, which brings pressures to adhere to um, in in an all natural version of motherhood and domestic practices, um, you know, which, which add to an already unequal division of labor in the house. And then on the other hand, and probably more problematically, you have developing world um, projections of of romantic, um, I mean, that's that's itself a loaded word, but uh, kind of naturalizing ideals um, of the farm, of agrarian labor, which, as you point out, is also unpaid often, uh, backbreaking, and 
performed disproportionately by poor women. So can you speak to the ways in which these tenants do burden women more than anyone else and why contemporary environmentalism hasn't really addressed these inequities? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll start by saying um, what, one of the things with environmentalism um, as a movement is that it's something that's always been embodied. Um, so environmentalists in general, you know, tend to seek sort of consistency between their political views and their visible lifestyle decisions. Um, and so, you know, as, as a new mom, um, I have, you know, if I'm cloth diapering, which I did for my kids, uh, you know, personally, um, but you know, if I'm cloth diapering, the cloth diaper one, you know, in theory, at least does something quantifiable for the environment, right? It, it has one less diaper, you know, one less disposable diaper going into a landfill, even though the trade-off between energy, uh, put into washing diapers and drying them. I mean, it's, it's marginally better. I went down the rabbit hole with that too. Um, but you know, so I'm cloth diapering, right. But then when I go out onto the playground and, you know, another mom out there sees me as a cloth diapering type of mom that signals my broader framework as someone who identifies with a certain set of values, right? So this is not rocket science. This is the idea that every object, um, you know, is signifies something and, and has a broader meaning socioculturally. So uh, for environmentalism, and this has happened for a long time, a lot of these sort of micro scale decisions, we may know they're not doing much quantifiably, but they are serving to embody a particular set of politics and identify ourselves, you know, brand ourselves as being a member of a certain sort of affinity group, right? So this choice, you know, especially as, you know, and again, a lot of these things come on, you know, with motherhood, you know, this is not just a way of, you know, sort of trying to save, you know, save the earth in a quantifiable sense, but a means of finding our affinity group sort of out, out, out there in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, another thing I found as I was looking into uh, this, this vein of, of research was that um, there was a real dichotomy um, with respect to the working world and the garden and the home, you know, the domesticated world and the working world. Um, you know, if, if you look at those ads from the 1950s, you know, where the husband comes home and the wife pours the cocktail and they go and they relax, the, the, the home and by association, sort of the garden and the small farm are really supposed to be outside of the realm of this, you know, um, uh, uh, labor-driven capitalist environment. So they're kind of this antidote, right? So there's almost something tainted about thinking about unpaid labor as something that, you know, could and should be monetized. Right. So these ideas of, you know, of, of, of what is the worth of a, of a mom's you know, time per hour as they're cloth diapering or cooking, it's almost it's almost you know, unheard of to even sort of think about, you know, <laughs> uh, conflating money with cooking a, a homemade meal, you know, with fresh vegetables from the garden, um, you know, to, to sort of think of that as something that, you know, well, how much would you be paid on an hourly basis to be doing that? Um, so so you've really sort of got this dichotomy, you know, between between the work world and 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 the domestic world. And and these don't need to be gendered. But for better or worse, um, you know, I think I think we could agree for worse. You know, they they, they tend to be. Um, and, you know, in the paper, I, I say some statistics about the way in which there's there's literally no country globally, where women and men perform the same, even remotely near the same number of unpaid labor hours in a day. Um, it's just how it is. And, you know, one of the critiques I've gotten for the article, and I think it's I think it's a good one, which is, you know, this isn't really addressing these larger structural imbalances. Um, but I think, Alex, did you were you the one that said the proximate possible? Um, but I love that concept. Um, and can you can you tell us a bit about what that is? Because I've never heard it from Alex. <laughs> Was that your term, Alex, or am I misremembering? <laughs> I stole it from somebody. Oh, okay, good. So we've all stolen it from someone. Um, <laughs> uh, but this idea of uh, uh, what what can we do 
given what we have right now, you know, that's how I've interpreted it. And, and the phrase sort of was, was ringing in my head, you know, while I've revisited, you know, sort of this, this line of study. Um, I, I, I agree that there are these huge structural imbalances, you know, but as an environmentalist in the meantime, you know, what, what can I do? Um, and I think one of the proximate possible things is to examine the sort of individual lifestyle behaviors that we're advocating and the degree to which those disproportionately create more labor on one gender, one gender or the other. And to, so to give some historical context to that, um, you know, over the past 50 years, as women have entered the workplace more and more in the U.S. at least, I mean, the, the that kind of disproportionate division of labor has decreased, right? So the fear is that we could perhaps move backwards on that positive trend uh, with these kind of practices. Um, yeah, exactly. So, you know, like you say, um, women and, and men, again, um, are, are doing less and less household labor. And one of the things I, I didn't talk about in the piece, and I think I was, you know, rightfully critiqued for by, you know, um, Mike Finewood and Teresa Laura Bedart, you know, was this idea that, you know, I, I don't mean to discount um, the agency of women in, in choosing or men in choosing the way that they engage with both the paid and the unpaid workforce. Um, you know, if, if someone wants to vacuum um, or sweep or, you know, come over to my house because <laughs> I've got a lot of work. Um, no, but I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sort of denigrate um, anyone's choice of how they engage with the paid or unpaid economy. Um, but at the same time, you know, one of the one of the folks I, I take to task a little bit in the paper, um, you know, is, is Michael Pollan. And I'll say this as, you know, pr- almost a lifetime Michael Pollan fan at this point. Um, I met him 10, 15 years ago. He's a lovely human being. I still think his book Second Nature is absolutely fantastic. And he's done some really great work at the intersection of, you know, how do humans engage with, you know, species that you know, eat their carrots, you know, how do, how do we do this in a conscious way? Um, so I admire his, I admire his work a lot. Um, you know, but, but one thing that he, I don't think does very well is, is differentiate the difference between a hobby and a job when he talks about cooking. And just because a job is not paid doesn't mean it's not a job. And I think, you know, when, when Michael Pollan and I, you know, at least, emotionally parted ways. He didn't know what was happening, but it was happening. <laughs> um, I was reading a, I was reading an issue of cooking light magazine. My father-in-law subscribed me to it. And um, you know, here's a little blurb on him. This was when his cooking book came out and he talked about um, how no one should, no one should ever caramelize onions for anything less than a half an hour. Um, and the interviewer pressed him on this. You know, she said, well, what about people who have 20 or 30 minutes to put a meal on the table? And he said, oh man, he said, well, that same person has, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to do yoga or surf the internet. Ouch. <laughs> and I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't even get into the gender stuff with yoga. Um, <laughs> but you know, the whole idea that actually, if you, you know, if you could, you know, and, and is it surfing the internet? Is it doing one's remote job? Is it, you know, versus doing yoga? Um, you know, who knows what someone's doing with their time in the evening, you know, but, but, you know, the taking this idea of the family meal and loading it with every social ill a social, environmental, cultural ill in the world and, and, and making it be this, you know, beast of burden for fixing everything that's wrong. And the fact that that still ends up landing on women, um, it's just not fair. You know, it's the family meal is supposed to fix obesity and, and, you know, families that come together, you know, the children are in less trouble and they have less ADD. And, you know, if you do that, then the environment's but I mean, it's just it's too much for any one thing to bear. And by ignoring the way in which the meal is laden with so much more than it can ever stand up to, um, and, and, and the fact that it's, 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 you know, it does tend to be women who are still responsible for the vast majority of the cooking, 
Um, again, this varies from household to household. Men are doing increasingly more. But again, if you look at the stats, it's it's nowhere near equal. Um, it's just it's just unjust. And, um, you know, Pollen was uh, uh, he's been taken to task for this a, a, a bit. I still don't feel like he's sort of, you know, responded in a way that is robust enough. Um, you know, he criticized Betty Friedan for, for you know, uh, making women, you know, in the 50s, you know, feel like household labor was drudgery. Um, and, you know, you, you were asking about the historical side of things. You know, he, he's always talking about how um, his grandmother cooked. We're all supposed to cook like our grandparents and I really want to see someone interview his grandmother. <laughs> um, and maybe she loved it. Um, but leaving the grandmother who was doing the cooking out of this conversation seems to be such a blind spot um, and really dovetails with the way that I think many women feel for, for having this task that just has become increasingly meaningful. When again, when you look historically, the second a, a, a family moves up in class, they try to outsource some of this labor. Um, you know, so for all the Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow is making these amazing vegan meals, there's there's someone dropping off the dry cleaning and, and picking up the kids and, and doing the sort of um, less symbolic things that need to be done to make to make a household run. Yeah, let's. I mean, can we hear a little bit more about the class-based dimensions of this? I mean, it's certainly related to the the gender-based um, problems, but it's almost it, it's another um, problem that you draw out in the essay. I think that's really important to these environmental discussions that are, is so often overlooked by Pollen, especially. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and and there is a, a, a huge sort of class based aspect of this. And and I cite an article um, called "The Joy of Cooking" by Bo and Elliot and and Brenton. And it's it's a great article. They went and they interviewed a lot of um, families at different socioeconomic levels uh, and different ethnic uh, compositions. Uh, and, and they asked them about you know how they felt about cooking and and how they dealt with it in in their own lives. You know, there was one I, I talk about in the article, you know, this was a, a working class African-American couple. They were employed by two different fast food restaurants, which were 45 minutes apart. I think it was the same chain, but it was two different restaurants. Um, and they didn't know their schedules ahead of time. Um, and they're taking, you know, public transportation to and from work. Work hours are uncertain. Um and meal planning and cooking from scratch is is just something that's uh, immensely more challenging when you, when one's life is structured in in that kind of a um, uncertain way. You know, I think this is something that you know Will Boisvert brought up in an article that that I think was published on the Breakthrough blog years ago. But he was looking at CSAs. Um, and, you know, I've, I've joined CSAs. I think they're fantastic. And, you know, I'm, I'm literally the demographic for whom there's the easiest, you know, they're the easiest, you know, I'm a upper to middle class white woman who's educated, you know, it should be, if it's going to be easy for anyone, it's got to be easy for me. Um, and, you know, the pickups are from, you know, two o'clock to two forty five on Thursday at this farm way out, you know, some country road that isn't served by public transportation, you know, and the idea that, um, again, you know, that is sort of promoted by Lifestyle Greens, which is, you know, we just need people to care more. Um, you know, it's not caring that's the barrier. Um, the barrier is these larger structural circumstances that affect people very differently. Um, another thing that I think is important is, you know, that that kids, um, you know, they say something like kids need to try a food, you know, or they need to like see the food on their plate 12 times before they like it. Um and, you know, on a limited budget, you know, being able to sort of buy fresh bell peppers and cut them up and put them on a plate and figure out a way to cook them, you know, so your kid takes one bite and then maybe or maybe not, um, you know, decides it's something that they'll eat. Uh, it's just not logistically or economically something that makes very much sense. Um, so it makes sense that when you're dealing with these constraints, you know, having something shelf stable um, and prepackaged is 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 something that's going to um, uh, be what fits within within the life in which you're living. 
Um, again, I'm not saying that this is fair or just, but the burden should not be placed on sort of, you know, the woman again or man, but largely the woman at the center of this household who's really trying to juggle all these competing demands. And, and those demands are different um, for different socioeconomic groups. Another thing you touch on your essay, Jen, is the developing world and uh, the ways in which uh, demands of the economy or the environment fall overwhelmingly on women, whether it's gathering fuel wood or, or growing or gathering food or, or, ta- or t- preparing food or, 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 or taking care of families. So can, can you talk about what technology and modernity have to do with women's liberation, particularly in poor and middle income countries? Yeah, definitely. Um so, you know, I think that actually, you know, these sort of narratives around the developing world are a lot more, you know, up to speed um, because, uh, you know, <laughs> it's harder to romanticize an, an agrarian, you know, an agrarian subsistence lifestyle when it's it's so close in, in, in one's memory um, because it's hard work. Um, farming is difficult. <laughs> and I think anyone who's been engaged in farming on a day to day basis knows that that it, that it's 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 hard. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that some of the most successful and widely recognized movements throughout the world, you know, such as the Green Belt movement, are movements that have combined not just environmental concerns, but economic concerns and um, concerns that sort of uh, further women's empowerment. So, you know, for instance, with, you know, with the Greenbelt uh, movement in Kenya, you had women who were gathering fuel wood, um, contributing to deforestation. They were burning them, you know, in their homes. And, you know, this was contributing to asthma. You know, so this idea of biogas digesters and uh, ways of, you know, creating fuel that wasn't so harmful to both the environment, uh, freeing women up to have more time to pursue different economic pursuits, making it so that women and children who tended to be home the most weren't suffering these adverse health effects. Um, you know, it's it's these it's these initiatives that combine multiple development goals, not prioritizing necessarily the environment over any other or sort of romanticizing fuel wood gathering, farming, all these sort of, you know, back to the land type activities um, through this guise that, you know, oh, women are, are sort of, you know, they're more inherently connected to nature. So this is sort of what we're meant to do and how we're going to, you know, kind of heal the earth. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's tone deaf, I guess I would say. <laughs> and I, I, I think a lot of this is also rooted in, you know, uh, the, the 1964 essay um, uh, by Leo Marx, The Machine in the Garden. It, it, it argues that um, American pastoralism has always sort of had this contradictory relationship towards technology. Um, and I would say that, you know, that hasn't changed much since 1964, uh, we really sort of have yet to reconcile um, this machine in the garden and and what its role is and 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 what it will will do for us. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of scholars out there. You know, I, I mentioned Lee Phillips earlier, but he's one of these folks that um, if if we can sort of decouple these ideas of capitalism and technology from one another, uh, look more carefully and precisely at the role of government innovation in fueling certain technologies, we can sort of unpack some of these knee-jerk reactions that um, mainstream environmentalism has towards, you know, technology, technological innovations, um, and and maybe make it so that you know the the uh, the burdens of sort of this technology-free lifestyle don't fall on particular groups, um, especially when they're being advocated by groups who are really sort of reaping the benefits of of technological innovation without you know maybe even maybe even being aware of it. Yeah. So, I mean, how optimistic would you say you are that that mainstream environmentalism can absorb these perspectives, you know, both of of thinkers like Lee Phillips and of voices more in the developing world um, that do indeed take, you know, both modernization and feminism perhaps more seriously? Do you think that's possible for mainstream environmentalism as well? I think that's a good question. Um, And, you know, I think it's hard to talk about mainstream environmentalism um, because, you know, it never really was a cohesive movement and I don't think it is now. 
Um, so I, I would say that, you know, there's a few different subgroups, you know, based on my own research, there's a few different subgroups within contemporary environmentalism sort of more generally. Um, you know, you've kind of got your traditional activist greens who are, you know, skeptical t- uh, about technology, you know, pretty catastrophic, um, believe in sort of grassroots social change as, as the root of forward progress. Um, you've got folks who, you know, are less catastrophic, less ideologically driven, uh, maybe believe a little bit more in the power of government and capitalism to be able to sort of rectify environmental problems. You know, you've got the eco-modernists who are, you know, looking at sort of large scale changes, fairly optimistic about the future, embrace technology. Um, I would say less than sort of dichotomizing folks like the eco-modernists, you know, who do differ from these groups in a lot of ways. But I, I think the group that I find kind of the most chilling um, are, are are the group that is very aware of environmental problems, um, but also extremely fatalistic and skeptical about the ability to engage at any level beyond the individual. Um, So you'll see these folks as, you know, I think they're the ones building, you know, like organic wine cellars, like in their bunker. Um, But they're also, you know, the folks who are very, Um, you know, very much sort of engaging in green consumerism and these lifestyle behaviors because um, they're they're, they're the group that that believes that anything beyond that individual scale is is not going to be effective. Um, They they care about the environment. They know a lot about it. They're highly educated. um, But but there's a lot of um, of of really resigned fatalism. and in, in my sort of preliminary analysis of this group, I actually I, I find that they're really um, economically and ethnically diverse. Uh, and I wonder the degree to which their diversity has made them sort of um, at the receiving end of these systems that they don't feel are just and therefore are very skeptical about the ability of those same systems to rectify environmental problems in the same way that they're skeptical of those systems to be able to rectify social, um, social and racial disparities. Um, so I, I, I've seen sort of mainstream quote unquote environmentalism seem in many ways to become more open-minded over the years. You know, I would say that, you know, most mainstream environmentalists um, accept things like restoration ecology uh, you know, which is this idea, uh, you know, maybe maybe not now through sort of technological innovation, but, you know, through at least sort of saying, hey, we want this ecosystem to look this way. And, you know, humanity has introduced these species and we have to get in there and we live in the Anthropocene and we have to choose what species we think sort of contribute to the um, ecological stability of, of this place. Um, so there's sort of an open-mindedness towards that. I think I was also reading, I was really surprised, uh, they were talking about lab-grown meat in a, in a newspaper article. And, you know, I always like to read the comments just to sort of get a, get a, um, a a read on, (laughs) on, I know you're never supposed to read the comments, but I like to sort of get a read on, on what people, and I was really surprised the degree to which from sort of an animal rights perspective, um, there was a, a, a real sort of pro- you know, quote unquote, lab meat sentiment in the comments, I said, Oh, wow, maybe maybe things are changing a little bit. Um, So I guess I'm more more optimistic about mainstream environmentalism than I am towards these groups that just feel utterly despondent and resigned. Um, That there just is is no way is no way out of, of the situation that we've made for ourselves. Outside of that, outside of environmentalism, Jen, I'm, I'm curious what kind of progress you see in the world that makes you optimistic about the future. All right. This is really top of mind and it's probably going to put me in a camp that, you know, but I'm, I'm trying harder to connect my, you know, my personal life with, you know, my intellectual life. Um, but I, I run the school garden at my kid's school and I've critiqued school gardens in the past. You know, oftentimes I find that um, I, I'm, I'm doing something and simultaneously critiquing it <laughs> in my writing and, and, you know, but that's the, that's the curse of an academic. We can't do anything without overthinking it. Um, but, uh, I will say 
it's, it's, you know, and, and part of the problem I've, I've had with school gardens in the past is, you know, why should we be gardening? Why should we be farming? Um, why is there this huge push, you know, and Julie Guthman at UC Santa Cruz, she, she has a great story about how um, these first generation immigrants were spending all this, you know, in Salinas, were being asked to go spend all this time in the school garden. And, and, you know, in terms of that kind of tone deafness, actually, you know, these kids, they shouldn't be gardening, like, they should definitely be doing something else. Um, you know, that said, you know, every day when I go pick up uh, my older daughter from school, you know, we go out, we water the garden, and I get absolutely mobbed. I have 20 kids out there, I don't really have anything for them to do, but I give them a shovel and some dirt. And, um, you know, once they start to realize that, you know, worms are cool, there's a lot of them who will kind of find the worm and, and uh, 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 initially be kind of grossed out by it or initially not want to get their hands dirty. But, you know, they bring it over to me and I get really excited about the worm and I tell them, you know, go find your favorite plant and go put it by there. And so then worms are the cool thing to do. I mean, Grant, you know, this is elementary school. Um, but, uh, you know, I came into that garden kind of a curmudgeon, you know, feeling like, oh, yeah, these school gardens don't do anything. But seeing this sort of honest excitement um, that the kids come out with, it's it's really, you know, cheesy, but it's it's true. They come out and they're excited um, and they all want something to do out there and um, are are just innately excited, excited about playing around in, in the natural world. So, um it's uh, it's 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 what charges me up on a day to day basis. Well, that's lovely. I go against the grain in a couple of ways, and I, I think millennials are actually going to save the world. But maybe maybe <laughs> the the next generation of kids are even better than us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I'll bring a little camp stove out, and we'll saute the worms with some kale, and 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 we'll uh, revolutionize the whole industrial food system. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jen, yeah, I mean, we, we we really admire that attitude, the both kind of um, the critical attitude toward standard assumptions, but also the willingness to actually engage in the world and, and appreciate the natural world and the things that you can um, do and connect with others over. So I, I think we all share that attitude here, despite the kind of tensions and paradoxes that come with it. Yeah, and I've seen that. I've seen that definitely, um, you know, on you guys are always going camping or something like that. Um, no, I agree. And I think that, you know, part of the response to the article, you know, had a lot to do with women, you know, myself included, who were really trying to be good environmentalists. You know, we were trying to, you know, uh, do the cloth diapering and make the baby food and do the breastfeeding. And the folks who we most looked up to in the environmental community were not giving us a break. Um, of course, we were supposed to be doing this. Aren't you an environmentalist? And I, I think that, you know, if the article did anything, it was that it sort of, I, I feel like took a little bit of pressure off those women who were going through sort of the same life stage that I was at the time, um, where you sort of felt like the environment was this yet another thing that we had to take care of and, and fit into this very small amount of time um, that, that we had in addition to sort of, you know, the day to day, the day to day of life. Um, you know, so if, if, you know, we can sort of have that forgiveness, you know, where maybe some days we are out in the garden and we are eating radishes and, you know, the kids are trying kale and, you know, finding worms, but other days, you know what, sometimes they just want French fries from the drive through and that's okay too. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I do think that balance of, of trying to actualize your morals and your beliefs while also sort of having an understanding, um, that the world is complicated and having sort of forgiveness for, you know, ourselves and the people around us for, you know, trying our best, I, I think is really important. And I think that that compassion is, is something that, um, environmentalism is, you know, getting increasingly better at, but I think we could do better at. Well, Thanks so much, Jen, for taking the time to speak with us today. It was a really pleasure to talk with you about all your fascinating ideas and um, insights. Thank you guys so much. Let me know uh, if you need anything else, but uh, it was great. It was, a, it was a really fun conversation. That's all for this episode of Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us on iTunes, and subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts. We want to again thank our guest, Jen, and our producers, Alyssa Kadaman and Tali Perlman. Until next time, I'm Emma Brush. And I'm Alex Trembath. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.